Uh, Dr. Tillett has uh, selected Reverend Donnell Simmons. Amen. To bring us a word from on high. And I have no doubt in my mind it's going to be fire baptized. You know what I'm saying? So, so if you don't know Reverend Donnell Simmons, she is a very faithful, true servant of God the Most High. Amen. No doubt about that. And she's one of the major reasons why this ministry has flourished the way that it has. Because she's taken her talents and her spiritual giftings and she has applied them here in this ministry to serve God and to serve us. Amen. So would you please point your hands over toward this way as an act of faith. Say, Father Almighty, in the name of Jesus, we simply ask that you refill Reverend Simmons with your Holy Spirit. Use her in such a way that it will glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I don't know if they can get a camera and span in here, but I want you to repeat after me because I know he's watching. Say, Pastor Tillett, Lady Tillett, we love you and we look forward to you being back. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Lord, I just want to thank you. Lord, I just want to thank you. I don't want to give you a superficial thank you. I want to give you an authentic, deep down on the inside. Thank you, God, for waking us up on this morning, starting us on our way, giving us the activity of our limbs, giving us breath in these old bodies to say thank you, God, on this morning. We can't sit down on him. So I don't know what you came in the house to do on today, but I'm going to tell you right now, God is in the house, and if you need God said, give him the praise that he deserves on this morning. God, I just want to say thank you, Lord. Glory to your name, Jesus. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. 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 We're going to shift this very atmosphere in this sanctuary. Hallelujah, God. I thank you, Lord, for your ever-present help in the time trouble. I just want to say thank you, God, for the abundance of your grace and your mercy in the house on today, God. I just want to say thank you, Lord. Ooh. You don't know what your neighbor's got to have to go through to get here on this morning. So just for that, God, I say thank you that they pressed their way and they pushed their way and they made it into the house of the Lord. One more time, God. I just want to say thank you. We didn't come here to play with the Lord on today. So if you ain't serious about it, sit on down. But if you're serious about the God that you serve, you better give God a Shabbat in the house. Good God Almighty. Good God Almighty.
Hallelujah. Give them what they need, God, in this moment so that they can hear you clearly and distinctly, God. Oh, God, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. in June of 2023. Where has the time gone? But better yet, what have you done with the time that has already passed you by? In the name of Jesus. Oh God. Mm. Oh God. Let, let me let me move in this spirit. Uh, I give honor to my Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ who allows me to stand before you on this morning. I give honor to the shepherd of this house, our pastor, Reverend Dr. Keith Tillett. Amen. You can give a hand clap of praise for the shepherd and for our assistant pastor, the Reverend Dr. Leon Newton, for this opportunity because they didn't have to call my name. Thank you to the ministerial staff for all that you do, your prayers and your support. It is greatly appreciated because I don't always find myself worthy to stand behind this old sacred desk. But thanks be to God for all of you being in the house on today, whether you're in here or you're online, we thank you for being in the house of God yet one more time. I pray that we are like those mentioned in Proverbs 19 and 20, who listen to advice and accept instruction that we may gain wisdom in the future. Hallelujah. Today, I'm going to be coming from, the scripture is going to be Daniel chapter 3, verses 17 through 25, but I'm only going to read three of those verses. I'm going to read verse 17, 18, and 25 because I just want to get to the point of the matter. And I'm reading from the New International Version. If you have King James, you got the phone, you got the message, you got the living, you just got God speaking in your ear. It is still yet his word. Amen. Amen. And it reads, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. And verse 25 says, and he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the Son of God. If I had to leave you with a subject or a topic or a title, whichever word that you would like to use for today, it is as this, outcomes of an if-then God. Outcomes of an if-then God. Let us pray. Preach, Holy Spirit, preach. Take control of this vessel and let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be ever pleasing in your sight, God. This is all for your glory and not anything else. And it's in Jesus' holy name that we pray on this morning. Let the church say amen. Amen. 
and amen. If y'all know me by any stretch of anything, you know I'm not going to be before you long. So if you give me 30 minutes, minus 25, plus maybe 19 and a half, that's about as long as I'm going to be here before you on this morning. I promise you that. If I begin to talk too fast, just say, preacher, slow down so that we can get what we need to get from you. But I'm not going to belabor what God has given unto me. I give what he gives and I don't add to it. And then I'm going to sit down in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I heard somebody say, come on now, I'm coming. Outcomes of an if then God. I know this may sound somewhat out of the ordinary. However, that is God's way of getting our attention. The things that are not familiar, the things that are not clear to us sometimes is how God has to point some things out to us. So let's begin by explaining what I mean by if then if then is known as a conditional statement or argument that's geared towards deductive logic. These statements are made up of a premise and a conclusion. Now one must understand this thinking method that strives for one's mind to prove the argument they are attempting to put forth as truth. So as one hears these conditional statements, you must be acutely aware of the verbiage being used, the hypothesis being put forth, and the conclusion one is attempting to reach. Sometimes the if-then or conditional statements are untrue when one or even both parts are false, but especially when the hypothesis or your premise is true and the conclusion is false. Put a pin in that because I'm going to make it make sense in just a moment. And I know this sounds like a lot of hubbub and a whole bunch of blah, 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 but let me simplify it for those of us who want to get to the point and to the conclusion of the matter. In regular people's terms, it really means do what I tell you to do or else. Okay? You remember when you was growing up, your mama said, if you touch that hot stove, you're going to get burnt. If you go out that door when I told you not to go, you're going to get your behind whooped. You, y'all, y'all, y'all act like y'all don't remember. I know. I'm not that old. And I know how my mama, daddy, grandmama, and granddaddy, and aunts and uncles was. There was consequence. There was an if and a then. If you did it, this was going to happen. Now, sometimes your if and then was good, and sometimes your if and then was bad. But it really was your choice in the whole matter. Am I right about it? Mm. Y'all don't have to agree with me, but it's okay. So in spiritual terms, because you know we got to talk natural and spiritual. But in spiritual terms, I'll say it like this. If you do, then God will. Okay, let me, let me show it to you in scripture. I'm going to tell you, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then you will be my treasured possession, Exodus 19 and 5. If we died with him, then we will also live with him. And if we endure, then we will also reign with him. If we disown him, then he will also disown us, 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. The one that I like the most is this one. If my people who are called by my name uh, will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then... Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. 2 Corinthians 7 and 14. So here is how it goes. If you do, then God will. If we do something for God, then he will do something for you. See, it's not the other way around. And see, in Christian life, we have turned that thing upside down and backwards. It's not that God will, what, that then God will do if you decide to do something for him. That ain't how it works. God is a God of order. And the order is you have to come to him as humble servants of his, not the other way around. He's not the servant of you. He will serve you, but he is not your servant. Understand that. If you get on your knees, if you get on your knees, and if you humble yourself, and if you get in a place of prayer, and if you submit your heart to God, if you will do the things that he commands you to do, then, then he will hear your cries. Then he will hear your land. Then he will save you from the fiery furnace. If you will do a thing for God, then you should expect a response. Not if God will give you a response, then you give him the praise that's, that's backwards. God, if you go on and bless me this way, then you know I won't come to you no more. That ain't how that works. God, you know if you gave me that million dollars, then you know I guess I might give some to the church. That is not how it works. You don't ask God to do something for you, and then you decide if you want to, if you want to do something for him. You see, God is a promise maker and a promise keeper. When you believe in him, trust his word so that you obey, and then he will respond. It's a terrible thing when you turn the if-then of God around into an if-then, if you please, sir. 
Okay, well, y'all didn't get that. Let me make that plain for you. And for those of us that might be confused, if God will, then I might. See, that's, that's what we typically do. If God will do something, then I might come to church. If God will do something, you know, if he'll raise my child and make him better, then I might go over there and say a prayer. Y'all know we've done that. I, am I the only one? In my time of not knowing who God was, I thought that God was supposed to do a thing and then I'm supposed to respond. That is not of God. But that's what some of us have been doing. You know, we've done this because we have allowed other things to turn our minds upside down. And we don't move unless God does something for us. Well, I'm here to tell you that is truly the definition of insanity. When you believe that God is waiting on you to praise him, believe in him, and do something for him, when you get good and ready, that's insanity. You wonder why your life is not settled. You wonder why God has not come to your rescue from the snare of the fowler. You wonder why God seems to not be listening to you. Well, it's because you have it backwards. He is the father and you are his child. You require him to be in your life. He don't need you in his omnipotent and omnipotent self to do anything in this world. He don't don't need you. You need him for everything that you have, everything that you say, everything that you do, everywhere that you go, how you live in this world. God don't need you to do anything, but you need him to do everything. You need to understand you got it backwards. But if you want God to move forward, you're going to have to change how you do things for God. You're going to have to change how you say things about God. You're going to have to change how you walk for God. You're going to have to change how you talk for God. You're going to have to do some shifting in the very mindset of yourself. Good God Almighty. Y'all ain't, y'all don't want to hear me. Ha, good God. And guess what? And God don't need you to put conditions on him. The one who blessed you to speak, move, think, and live in his creation. He does not owe us not one thing, but the only thing he owes us is to respond to the actions of those who wholeheartedly believe in him. The Bible says that faith without works is dead. Are you alive? Or are you on the verge of being consumed in the fiery furnace? Good God Almighty. I promise y'all I won't be here very long. I know as a good Methodist preacher I'm supposed to have three points, but today I really ain't got but two, Dr. Newton. So y'all forgive me as we go through this thing, okay? We ain't got but two. I ain't got but two. But hopefully you'll, it'll make sense to you by and by and you can make up your third when you get on to the house. How about that part? How about that? My first point is... <laughs> Hallelujah. God likes laughter. I'm just going to tell you how I know. You want how I know? Because I'm standing here. He, yeah, he loves me. He does. But my first point is, do your conditions align with God's perfect will and his conditions? Or better yet, do your conditional statements look like God's if-thens? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's a story we've all heard and talked about. And I don't know why lately God just been letting me look at stuff and stories just a little bit different. But we're going to talk about these three Hebrew boys. Guess what? These three had a made-up mind. How many of y'all have a made-up mind? Uh -uh, let, oh, wait a minute. Let me be very specific. Do you have a made-up mind about serving the God that is the King of kings and Lord of lords? See, I got, to, I got to make it plain. Thank you, Reverend Matthews. I better make it plain because some of you got a made-up mind about stuff that I don't, I don't want you to say out loud now. And some of that made-up mind, with well, some of that stuff, you need to let that go. But that's a whole nother subject, whole nother sermon. Praise the Lord. They had a made up mind. They purposed in their hearts not to engage in compromise by being untrue to God's call for commitment. They took a stance from the very beginning. Ah, they refused the food and wine offerings that God's law prohibited when they went into captivity. They did not compromise, so they presented their own if then statement for the chief of the eunuchs to consider. Had y'all even remembered that in the story? If you provide us, they said to him, if you provide us with only vegetables and water for 10 days and see how we fare compared to the rest, then if it's not satisfactory, you can deal with us as you see fit. If, then. It ain't just God, but it's in his word. And in that time, God endowed them with knowledge and skill and spiritual abilities that surpassed those who compromised their faith. At the same time, God was establishing a precedent for more miracles showing he was in the lives of these captive men. Are you in captivity or are you free? But as they progressed, so did God's blessings over their lives. So guess what? Here's the twist in the story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were living their best lives like many of us do every day. I know I try to very hard every day. And so I try my best to do what God has me to do. But guess what? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, they had some status in favor in this place called captivity, or so they thought. 
the new decree that had come from the king was that all would bow down and worship this golden image that he had created. How many times did the bell toll and they, they, they did not fall down and worship before somebody took notice? It's like, how many times you clock in late at work at your job before you get called in the HR or your boss's office? Oh, y'all, don't say nothing. Don't look at me. I ain't going to look at y'all. And how many times have you possibly worked through your lunch before somebody in the office says, they're not supposed to do that, and then they go run and tell somebody? <laughs> don't that just put a bee in your bonnet, cause you to, like, roll your eyes and smack your lips? I don't know what they're wearing with me for. I'm tending and minding my own business. That's what Shad, Red, Meshach, and Abednego were doing. And in this, it just shows that most times you're just trying to do your job, and here come the haters. You are not expecting these kind of shenanigans early on a Monday morning when you first get to work. You've been part of corporate prayer. You done had your meditation, your devotion. You know, you've been praying, and you're feeling pretty good, and you got to go up in there, and then here come the shenanigans. Messing with your day, Right? How many of y'all have experienced that? I know I did just the other day. I was like, I don't know who these demons are, but they, they ain't got but one more time to fool with me today. Okay, it'll shake you, right? Because that's not what you're thinking about. You got your mind stayed on other things, and so did they. But I can suspect that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not arise early that day expecting someone to go run and tell on them for not worshiping the gods of King Nebuchadnezzar. They surely were not thinking that they would be facing possible death by fire, flood, wind, guns, disease, or any other manner of death that day when they got up to go to work. They probably would not have even asked for a fiery death. I know I wouldn't. Who want to burn up? I don't. Not in, and I'm alive? No, sir. Hey, you can miss me with that one, Jesus. I, I'm going to go to another. I'm going to go to another. Can I check another box, Lord, by how I want to go? Um, I know we don't have options, but I'm just saying, God, if you can give me a choice, if I've done anything good, God, can I ask you how I want to go from here? I don't want, I don't want to. I'm just saying. I don't know what y'all talk to God about, but I talk to God about stuff like that, okay? I know, I know, I know. Y'all should know me by now. So, they also knew that they didn't get to choose the way that they would be punished for belief in the Most High God. They didn't really think about that. I don't think most of us think about that. But you should, because there's going to come a day, even in this day and time, that Christians are going to be persecuted even the more. They already are. But for those of us that sit in this wonderful building and we sitting all cushy and we all happy and we all good and we look good, guess what? It's going to come a day that even we will stand in punishment for the God that we serve. Are you ready for that? I don't know if we're ready for that. I'm trying. I ain't going to say. I know Dr. Newt ready. He, he, you know, he who? He ready. You know what I'm saying? You got to get ready. <laughs> say it again, Dr. Newt. <laughs> I love it. But the questions that I have for you, I want you to just think on these things. Did you know that you won't get a choice on your fiery furnace either? Did you know that you will be forced to choose ye this day who you will serve? Did you know that you must have a made up mind about the God or God that you're going to serve, big G or little G? Which one is it going to be? Did you know that you will face death because of what you choose to believe in? Did you know? I don't know if you know, but in my mind, I believe that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had a conversation with themselves that may have gone a little something like this. He said, self, self said, huh? You truly believe and love God? Self said, yep. Will you die for God? Self said, wait a minute. I don't think we talked about me laying down my own life. Make it make sense now. Well, you did. When you accepted the teachings of your fathers, when you accepted the truth about God, and when you began your own relationship with God, knowing that he would be with you always, that's the same place that we are in. But we don't understand sometimes that the thing that may come with what we believe in may not be what we expect, but we have to be ready for whatever's going to come. But knowing that God is going to give you the victory, God is always going to stand with you, God is always going to be there to support you, and God is always going to send a ram in the bush, God will be the one that's going to protect you in whatever place you find yourself in my God and in that moment their if then became living within them and if I serve God then I serve him with my life and in death because he is the true and living God and with that here comes the test of their faith and yours as well so King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, he was a powerful king during this time in history so powerful that he began to see himself as God little g, not no big g 
He believed himself above, above all other gods. Again, little G's, not no big G, okay? That he had even erected some of these thoughts in the minds and beliefs and idols of the people that were around him and that he had charged over. That's how powerful he believed himself to be. But God had to remind him of himself. And isn't that just like God? Sometimes God even must show you where you are operating. Too many times we move in ways which misaligns our will and God's will. The if then gets misconstrued. Listen, Nebuchadnezzar's powerful influence is noted in the treatment of the captives of war. The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego actually started with the story of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, a.k.a. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the story tells us of how their names were changed at the beginning of their captivity in Babylon. The change in the name would link them to the gods, little g, not big g, of that land, thereby attempting to strip away their former religious loyalty. Remember a moment ago when we mentioned how the king began thinking himself as God? The Bible tells us that God made it known that we shall not worship no other God. There will be no other gods before me, behind me, beside me, up under me. I am a jealous God. So even when King Nebuchadnezzar took it upon himself to change the God-given names and the God-given purpose-filled names of his, God's children, God said, oh, okay, I see you, but we're going to fix that. After a while, you just hold on tight, king. You think you're doing something, but I'm going to show you who I really am. But isn't it amazing uh, how we encounter these same identity thieves even today? People, social constructs, personal agenda keepers who seek to strip away the very essence of who we are as believers. The mind-altering tactics may at times push us into a place of believing and speaking things contrary to God's word. But the word has not changed its if-then format and it never will. So the king, knowing of the transgression of his law, he summons Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in front of everyone who had some position with the king. He created an audience. He created an audience. Mm. He presents his if then in two ways, okay? This is the king. And basically, it was an ultimatum when really there were no real options for the boys. If you really think about it, I'm going to tell you why. The first one was, he said, if you are ready to bow down, then fall and worship the image. They weren't going to do that. They already said they weren't going to do that. That's why they're standing before you now. Okay, option number one ain't viable, but that was option number one, right? The second one, he said, and if you do not worship, then you die. I just shortened what he said. He had a whole bunch of other words when you read the scripture, but I just shortened it. You don't want to worship, then you got to die. I mean, who going to choose that? Like, are you really going to choose? Okay, well, I'm just going to die. No. Even those of us who truly believe who God is, sometimes we take a second look about what it is that we're going to do and why we're going to do a thing. But let me tell you about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It wasn't nothing that the king was going to say to them to make them get off of what they believed and who they believed in. Good God Almighty. Their response to him was the best if then because it was delivered with assurance in God and that could not be ignored. Let me tell you what it said. I'm going to put it in my terms. I ain't going to, again, all these words in the scripture. Let me just make it plain for those of us that walk here in the, in the land of us. If you think our God can't do it, then try him and see. Y'all know how we used to be back in the day. Okay, you think I can't go there with you? Try me. Okay, you don't want none of this. You ain't ready. You, ain't, you don't want this smoke. That's basically what they told him, but in a very, very nice way. See, we sometimes in this day and age, we can't be nice and sweet. Sometimes we got to come out with the authority that God has put in us. Say, my God is bigger than what you would ever do to me. My God is bigger than you, them, and all of them. You and no army can take out the God that I serve. Good God Almighty. Good God Almighty. You better know who you're serving, who you belong to. Good God. Try him. Go ahead and try, King. You think you, you, think you all that? Hey. He was popping his own collar. Mm. And you know how you look at folk when you know that you know that you can beat them and they be doing all that? Bolstering and stuff. And you just be sitting there looking at them like, I don't have all day. Can you come on with what you're going to come on with? Because as soon as you cross that, you know we used to draw that line. Step over that line, right? That's what the boys did. They just drew the line. Come on over here, King. Let's see what's going to happen, right? <laughs> it was such a clear directive that God could save them or God could let them perish in the fire. But either way, they were not going to serve any other God or even man. 
That's what they said to the king. Go back and read it if you haven't read it in a while. They basically said, God can come and save us, or if he don't, it's okay. We'll perish in the fire. That's what the word says. So they knew with an assurance, guess what? I can live in, with him, and I can die with him. But if I die with him, I'm going to live again. So either way, they still going to win. Ha! Come on here now. Y'all better come on with your reading of the Bible. So guess what? The king, being his old insane self, you know I told you he was insanity earlier, had the heat intensified in the furnace. The furnace was already hot, y'all, okay? It was hot and it was big and it, it just didn't make no sense. But he said intensified seven times. How you intensify already hot fire seven more times? But he did. He made it even hotter. His sole intent was proving the if-then statement of the three Hebrew men wrong. He thought either their premise or their conclusion was incorrect. The fiery furnace was quickly turned into a crematory, if you will, with the sole purpose of killing these men quickly and definitively. It was going to be no mistake that he threw them in and they were gone. There won't going to be nothing left to identify, to scrape up, to put in a bag, to put in an urn, to look at some clothes. It was going to be nothing. That's got to be some madness that you don't want to see nothing of a person that you throw into the fire. How much rage and anger must you possess to say, I just want to obliterate them and any particle that could identify who they are. But guess what? We got people that walk around us every day that wish that they could obliterate us. But the God we serve says, ah, take your hand off my child. You can't have them. They will not perish. They will not die. <laughs> they will not be gone away with in this lifetime. Come on here now. Some of y'all know because we've been in that fire. I know I've been and I don't want to go back. But praise be to God. Wherever he tell me I got to go, I'll go. But Lord, if I ain't got to go in that fire, I praise you even the more on this day. Listen, the king just didn't want no evidence that they even existed when it was all said and done. That's a scary thought, but one that still exists, as I said, today in our lives and our experiences, because there are those who desire to invalidate our witness and eradicate our very presence because of the God we choose to serve. But God, listen, how is it that the very mechanism the king would use to destroy God's creation only slayed those from his court, his followers, and his servants? So guess what? You better be careful who you follow and who you serve. Ask yourself these two questions today. Who are you following? And two, why are you the follower? Take note of that in this story. Guess what? Then the king threw them in to the furnace. And the scripture says they fell to the bottom. The bottom of the furnace was down there by the fuel. The stuff that they used to heat it up. He intended for them not to come back. Because you down there by the heat, you, down, you on the charcoals of the grill. You ain't up on, you ain't on no rag. You ain't got nothing to protect you. You down there by the, you is, come on here now. Gonna make sure. Because he put him in there with all their clothes and shoes and belts and attire and headdress. He put him in with everything. Because he was going to make sure they caught, caught up in that fire. And guess what? The bottom of the furnace was the thing that was closest to the source of the fire. Again, total annihilation of God's children. But God said otherwise and was with them in the fiery furnace. He saved his children because they refused to disown him. Notice this. When the king sees four people, he threw in three. He saw four walking around in the fiery furnace. He questions what actually happened moments earlier. Would, would you be looking in there like that? I'd be concerned, too. I'd be concerned with just the little stuff I see. But doggone if I'm going to see four people walking around in a fire, in a furnace. Do y'all understand? Okay, how many of y'all have fireplaces? Old wood-burning fireplaces. Okay, when you look in the fireplace, you won't really get that close to it, right? You kind of keep your distance. You stay back, right? But, you, you know, you ain't, you ain't expecting to see nothing moving around. Because you see something moving around, you're going to be like, wait a minute. And who, who the first person you going to call? Jesus. Jesus, what's going on? Y'all know, I, listen, I ain't going to say nothing. It, it, it's okay. <laughs> he asks, so he goes up and he approaches the furnace, peering into what he thought was death that he had created and that supposedly was supposed to claim the lives of these people. But isn't it amazing how when the servants went up close to the fire, they immediately died. They got burned up whoop, like that, which is how... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were supposed to be gone in an instant. But King Nebuchadnezzar walked up and peered into the fire. 
Mm. Why didn't he die at the furnace? I said, God, what in the world? And God had to remind me, he said, even your enemy will be saved from the destruction they desire for you so God can produce a witness out of the most unlikely one. And when God saves you, he will do it in the presence of all who have gathered to see your demise. Because remember, he created a whole court of people to watch what he was going to do because they had disobeyed him. But God said, just because somebody wants to kill you, don't mean that that's going to be your final place. Just because somebody wants to see your demise, guess what? I'm going to see the, vi they're going to see the victory that I'm going to create in you. Good God Almighty, some of us are living witnesses to just that. I know I am. Hallelujah. So you can see why we shout and praise like we do because we know when the fiery darts and arrows have been shot up in our back. We know when people have come and dug a hole for us to fall in. We know when they said, oh, you're going to be in the grave before I am. But God said, not this one and not today because I got to work for them to do. Hallelujah. Woo, Jesus, God saves you. Mm. And he'll do it in the presence of other people. Now, my second point, I told you I don't have but two, and I won't be here much longer. Point number two, God keeps his promises. Remember, we established earlier that if-then conditional statements can be false. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar's conditional statement of what God, little g, will be able to rescue you from my hand was proven false. When God showed up to shut the mouths of the naysayers, the high-minded people, the ones that know everything but really know nothing, the doubters and the unbelievers, he solidified the statements of his followers as an absolute truth from that day to this day. But God, he already knew these events would occur and he established his word as a reassurance of his promise in Isaiah 43, 1 and 2 when it says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. So Hananiah, Mashiel, and Azariah embody Proverbs 3, 1 through 6, where I'm just going to paraphrase. It says, do not forget my law. But let your heart keep my commands. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. And so find favor and high esteem with God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. They did just that and God delivered them from the snare of King Nebuchadnezzar. God kept his promises and when they walked through that fiery furnace... <laughs> God not only kept the flames from setting them ablaze, but he also stood with them in the fire. See, he didn't just take them out. He showed up and stayed in there with them. I can only imagine the conversation they may have had with the Lord. Don't you talk to God when he shows up in the midst of your fiery furnace? I know I do. Or is it just me that wants to hear what he needs for me to know, but also give him glory for all that he has already done? Am I the only furnace walker in the sanctuary today? Am I the only backstroke believer in the troubled waters that did not sweep over me? Am I the only one bold one to speak of the if-then statement about the God that I serve? If God is for me, then who can be against me? If you send me, Lord, I will go. If I believe, I will see the glory of God. So you got to know who God is for you and what he's trying to do in your midst and for your divine purpose for the upbuilding of his kingdom. If you don't know, you better get in a place to talk to God so that you can know the next time you're in your own fiery furnace that God can come in and sit right there with you and talk to you about a thing or two. You can tell him all your troubles, but you can also give him a praise like never before. Good God Almighty. Good God Almighty. Good God Almighty. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they believed to see with their spiritual eyes. They felt with hearts of flesh and transformed their minds for the work of God's kingdom. The example they set still has power today. What do you believe? Who do you believe? And who do you belong to? Make your conditions about God and yourself foolproof so when you face the test, you can stand flat-footed in all assurance and authority as an unwavering witness for the power of God. When you do for God according to his will, then you can be assured of a response from him. You have to make up your mind today today that you will follow the promise maker who is also a promise keeper. There is no other little God, little G God, that can do what big God has already done. So as I get ready to close this thing on today, I told you I won't be here long. Remember this, everything we encounter or see is purpose-filled 
and necessary for the building of his kingdom. If you love him and his people, then he will surely show himself unto you. If you read, believe, and understand his word, then you can move the peace. You can have the peace that surpasses all understanding, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you get your heart in the right posture, then you can be assured that God will hear you. If you get your heart right and submit to him, then you can have an assurance of a place in the kingdom of heaven. If you make a choice to believe in him, then God will be with you in your fiery furnace. If you trust in his power, then he will show up in your storm. If you know that he's a healer, he will be your doctor. If you give your life to him as your personal Lord and Savior, then God will give you the gift of everlasting life. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Let us all stand to our feet if you're physically able. Can we give God a hand praise for Reverend Donnell Simmons? And that word, the outcome of a if-then God. Mm. Mm. Amen. And if you're in that furnace right now, I've been in it several times, probably going to go in it again. But I thank God Jesus was right there with me. Amen. Amen. Now we come to the part of our service where we want to extend Christian discipleship or salvation to those who may not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And what we mean by that, Romans 10 and uh, verses 9 through 10 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, thou shalt be saved. So we're asking you to bow your head. Now you know if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know that because the Spirit of God will witness to your spirit that you do. But if you don't have that witness from the Holy Spirit that you're a child of God, then we're asking you to come forward and you can become a child of God today by repenting of your sins. That simply means to have a change of thought about your sinful life, to recognize that you're a sinner in need of forgiveness from Jesus Christ. And he's the only one that can forgive you because he laid his innocent life down and shed his innocent blood for our sins. And if you have not confessed with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and truly believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, then you can come and do that now. We will lead you to Jesus Christ right now. Will you come? Will you come? Will you come? You heard the preacher say Jesus coming back one day could be today. The rapture could happen today. It could happen right now. Now it's not a time to play with salvation, brothers and sisters. You can raise your head up now. Thank you for your humble obedience. So I take it everybody say, you mean every single person in this sanctuary is saved. Man, that is a hallelujah moment. Amen. That's why y'all come to 830. Y'all don't play, do you? Amen. I'm saved folk come to 830 service. They, they getting up early. Amen. Amen. We certainly thank you for your time. Amen. Let us pray that then I'll give the benediction. And Chris, we're going to ask you to go with Sister Gentry. She'll come up right behind. Um, okay, let us pray. Father Almighty, we thank you so much for using Reverend Donnell Simmons, Lord. We thank you for teaching us today that the outcome of the if and then God will always give us the victory, no matter what we go through, because it is you that walks with us talks with us, leads, guides, and protect us, Lord. Now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray that you will be with this young sister, Chris, that you will begin to work in her to will and to act according to your good purposes, Lord. And for all those that are dependent on you, Lord, for prayers that have been lifted up to your throne, we want you to know, Lord, we believe you hear our prayers, and we believe you will answer our prayers in your timing and in your way. And that's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now our benediction. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. Our threefold amen.
God be with you.